Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Armor of Faith, a show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. I'm joined today by my panel, which includes my lovely wife, Sharon, as well as Helen Hawkins. And our panelists represent a rather broad background in catechesis, which has gained in support of various parishes, as well as a variety of age and spiritual interest groups over the years. So welcome to our panelists, as well as to our listeners. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So we concluded part one of our discussion of our belief in the resurrection of the dead with a quote from John chapter 11, verses 25 to 26, where Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This question, do you believe this, Jesus asked of Martha. But what he asked of Martha, he also asked of us. And so in our profession of faith, we proclaim, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. This statement reveals to us the opportunity for everlasting life. But as we also saw in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 10, that after Peter, James, and John witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus, as well as Moses and Elijah standing before them, that they were somewhat bewildered, and as they came down the mountain, were told that they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Now, while we examine some scriptural examples from both the Old and New Testaments, the threads of this element of faith exist in many places. I mentioned that for the fullness of our understanding, we must look beyond one verse, passage, or book of the Bible. I also pointed out that one of the fundamental missions of the church is to help us unlock, for our modern-day comprehension, the elements of our faith. One means by which this mission is fulfilled is through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So today, we'll spend some time there, unlike what we did last time. So let's start with paragraph 298 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it states, since God could create everything out of nothing, he also, through the Holy Spirit, gives spiritual life to sinners by creating a pure heart in them and bodily life to the dead through the resurrection. God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. And since God was able to make light shine in darkness by his word, he can also give the light of faith to those who do not yet know him. If we look at Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, it states, It was not through the law that the promise was made to Abraham and his descendants that he would inherit the world, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. For if those who hear to the law are the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law produces wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, so that it may be a gift, and the promise may be a guarantee to all his descendants, not to those who only adhere to the law, but to those who follow the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you father of my many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, 
who gives life to the dead and calls into being what does not exist. So in this paragraph of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we see the reference to the fact that God created everything out of nothing. So what does this tell us about the power of God over death and life, and what does faith, righteousness, and the law got to do with it? That particular uh, passage uh, of the Catechism 298, I did not know about this passage, but the thinking behind it is what really led me to believe that there it is possible that there's life after death and also the physical uh, somehow body uh, after death. Uh, it was something that I struggled with for a long time, even after I became a Catholic. It was it was part of the the dogma that I said, well, I I accept it as being true, but I I I don't know about it. You know, I didn't discount it, but I couldn't quite understand it. But when it really dawned on me who and what God is, it occurred to me, look what he did. I mean, am I going to put him in a box and say that he can't do this? You know, I mean, he created everything out of nothing. And it's so... There's no way to tell him what he can do. There's no way to tell him what he can do. That's absolutely right. And and the light of faith to those who do not know him. That's a comforting word when you think about people you love who, who might uh, not yet understand. He can, he, can, he can take care of them too, you know. But he knows all the situation. I remember as a kid, I can remember sitting in school and in Catholic school and talking about people in some of those remote African villages who've never heard of God and what was going to happen to their salvation. Were they going to be able to, to go to heaven? And we all sat there talking about it, and I remember the nuns saying, well, God knows what's in their heart, yes. and, and he will take care of it. And, 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 and he knows what's in the heart of people. I've had people say, well, if you just hear the word Jesus and you don't believe, you're going to go to hell, you know. And I'm saying, uh uh-huh. you know, Jesus knows us a bit more than that. He knows our experiences and what the roadblocks are. And he can, in his good time, break those roadblocks down. Because yeah, I, I think the real question is, is what is the nature of our belief and the nature of our unbelief? Because we're also told that and we know that even the demons believe. believe that's right. <laughs> um, and, and yet there they remain in the netherworld. So uh, it's, it's about the nature. And so that, that kind of brings us to, well, what does faith, righteousness, and the law got to do with it? Uh, it has everything to do with it because... Let's go back to the preposition, God knows whether or not we're lying to ourselves. He knows where we're at. He knows if we're making excuses. It is still our responsibility to think this through. And if you think about it, the, the nature of human law is, is often the case of black and white. You either violated the law or you didn't. You did not. And... And, of course, then that's what is determined um, by trial or, uh, or any number of legalities. But if we, for example, look at Jesus' response to the adulterous woman brought before him in the crowd wanting to have their afternoon stoning, um, and his response is, you remember what that was? But you without sin. Yeah, first step. Yeah, first and, and so he is, what he is bringing out is it's not just about the black and white. It's about the nature of what is in our hearts. And so, therefore, it's about the nature of our belief. And it's about part of our, of our faith teaches us that we have to recognize 
that what we have done has been wrong and we need to be sorry for it, even if we might not be able to express it just so. Well, what about this? We're talking about two different laws. There's the laws of man that we have to live by because we live in the community. We can't just race down the road at 150 miles an hour and not worry about running anyone over. And then there's the laws of God. They're completely different. The laws of God, remember, speak of loving the Father and loving our neighbor. And so we have to take care of those two two parts of our lives. And if you know all, if you know and understand the laws of God, you're going to succeed everywhere. If you only learn and understand the laws of man, well, you're going to you're going to slide right through on a, a bad skate into heaven and right and bump into Jesus, and he's going to say, "What about?" And you're going to go, "Well, you know, I had a constitutional right," and he's going to go, "But that wasn't my law." Yeah. So, well, yeah, the we, laws of man are really tricky too. When you're thinking about uh, just ask my husband, who was a water in charge of the water and the federal laws negated the state laws. Oh, and the state the, laws they yeah, yeah. all the arguments going back and forth. And, and, and you, if, you, if you had to uh, if you disobeyed one law you were in violation with the other and they both would come down on you. Mm-hmm. And of course the laws of man, as we have seen, uh, are not always right and just, right? No. So But the laws of God are her always so let's take a, a a look here at Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. And it says, but whatever gains I had, these I have come to consider a loss because of Christ. More than that, I even consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have accepted the loss of all things, and I consider them so much rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having any righteousness of my own based on the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God, depending on faith, to know him, and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, if we also look into to paragraphs 428 and 429 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it reads, whoever is called to teach Christ must first seek the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. He must suffer the loss of all things in order to gain Christ and be found in him, and to know him and the power of his resurrection, and to share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that if possible, he may attain the resurrection from the dead. From this loving knowledge of Christ, bring the desire to proclaim him, to evangelize, and to lead others to the yes of faith in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we need to know this faith better makes itself felt. Now, these paragraphs of the Catechism of the Catholic Church carry a message not only for those listeners who are parents, catechists, who are engaged in any other vocation or ministry responsible for teaching and evangelizing our faith, but for all of us who profess our faith. For in professing, we should also have a desire for sharing the fullness of the good news of the Lord. So as we look back at at Philippians, and we also look at these paragraphs of the Catechism, why do we think Paul, who is one of the greatest evangelists of the word, qualifies his observation with the words, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And why must we know Jesus if we are to explain the power of his resurrection? Sometimes when I think of of how to teach others about Christ and how we can know Christ, um, I, I, I think it, our feelings would be or could be similar to them what it means to, to stand on, on uh, let's say, our mountain, Grand Mesa, our beautiful 
and the and it is so beautiful looking across the our, our beautiful Colorado mountains. Mm-hmm. I love I love my I love my world here, <laughs> and and the feeling should be in discussing Christ is, oh look, see what I have. And, and and if we really love Christ, that will be our emotion about him is, oh, look, look, look and see. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't he wonderful? Rather in terms of you better believe in him or else. That that doesn't go anywhere. But if you really feel that, that beauty and that joy, you just almost can't help but say, you know, oh, look. Oh, isn't isn't it wonderful? You might drive people just as much crazy, but still they will feel that you really, really love him and you really, really care. It it is something that causes awe because when you think of all the beauty which surrounds us and then all the complexity of which drives our animation, which drives our consciousness, which drives our ability to sense the world which surrounds us. And yet with all of man's technology and all of man's intellect and the number of generations that have come together and shared this and gathering all the scientists of the world, we have barely scratched the surface of understanding God's creation. We, we think we know so much, and yet the reality is we know so little. But then when we start examining the wisdom of the scripture, there always seems to be so much more to find there. And and we're drawn to it. We're drawn to it because of what it contains in terms of the blessings of love. But what I find interesting about St. Paul's comment uh, in, in his letter to the Philippians, he says, if somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead, and you would think, well, this is the man that Jesus came to and said, I'm going to have you spread my message to the Gentiles, to the kings, to the nations. And in fact, as we observe through the book of, of Acts onward and, and his letters that are contained within the New Testament, we see that St. Paul was probably one of the, the major figures in terms of spreading the message of Christianity. And so he has a qualifier there, if somehow I may obtain the resurrection of the dead, which means he's not the judge. And also, well, at other times Mm -hmm. he says, I don't even judge myself. Mm -hmm. But this shows a a huge uh, amount of humility on his part. And that's something we don't practice much of anymore. You know, we all, I did it, I did it all by myself, and no one can take that away. I did it my way. And no, that's not always <laughs> But, you know, but, but the, this is the humility that God, that God is calling us to also, also have. It's his awareness of what he, I, I mean, it's the awareness of, of his awe, you know, like, he has seen the beauty, and he and it's impossible almost for him to take it in. If he's just somehow totally take it in and understand it, it's there. Well, I think he understood what the job he was given to yes. evangelize, and yet in his mind, and it should be for all of us, the understanding that wow, this is pretty awesome, but there's where the fear of the Lord comes in. Am I doing injustice? Yeah. Am I doing what he called me to do? Am I serving him worthily? And, you know, unfortunately in today's world, we don't often think that way. It's like, oh, well, I'm doing what I'm doing, and that's good. If you kind of look at it in this way, is that, of course, the more that you learn, the more you realize there's so much more to learn. And at the same time, there is this constant conversation, who is saved? Am I saved? Do I know I'm saved? What is the magic formula to be saved? And and we go back and forth with all of that. And then we also realize that the evil one is out there setting so many traps for us, so many traps by the behaviors of sin. 
And so I think what, what St. Paul reveals to us is that there is this great message. And in reality, if we look at it, it is rather simple, and yet we make it so complex. The reality is, and, and I think Sharon hit upon a very important topic here, is, is that importance of humility, of that importance of not being overconfident. Um, and again, it comes back to the nature of our belief. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but I shall have everlasting life. But it's the nature of that belief that we want to be able to examine. Now, I don't think God wants us to sit around and fear, am I going to hell, am I going to hell, am I going to hell? I don't think that, that he has that in mind at all. I don't think that was the intention, that gift we get in confirmation of fear of the Lord. I don't think it was to think of this overimposing ogre that is going to just condemn us to hell. I, th- I think the purpose of that was so that we could recognize our humility before God and to recognize that he is the maker of everything. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And who are we? But if we're going to go out and teach, if we're going to go out and, and present God to people, we better be doing it right. And we better be paying attention and studying hard. Because that's where the fear of the Lord comes in. You see it in what he says here is, am I being worthy? Am I teaching the truth? The last thing, when when I get up to teach, the last thing I want to do is to teach in heresy. Um, And so that's that's where the concept of fear of the Lord comes in. It doesn't have anything to do with God being this ogre person. It's, It's the fact that we want, you know, like as kids, we wanted to do that. We wanted to please our parents, yeah. you know, and we didn't want to take home a bad report card. And we also we also have to understand the connotation of words, too, because the, the term fear of the Lord is not just one of the fear we would we would have of horror, for example, but is it is more of a respect and and those who you could, if you took that word fear and changed it to respect of the Lord, we we have a a fear of something greater than us. But it's it's a nature of respect uh, that we might be looking at. Oh, so one thing, yeah, I've told people, you know, I've got the cute little fuzzy things that people say about God, and I'll say, God is not a soft, warm, fuzzy. He did create the forces that make black holes. <laughs> yeah. And and hence we can be sure too. So Yeah. Uh, so let's I don't know where I'm going with that. Don't but anyway. <laughs> let's look at uh, paragraph nine ninety one of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it says belief in the resurrection of the dead has been an essential element of the Christian faith from its beginnings. The confidence of Christians is the resurrection of the dead. Believing this, we live. How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And, and this paragraph is basically quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 12 to 14. So in this paragraph of the Catechism, it cites our confidence as Christians, but it references scripture where Paul is speaking to a crowd where some do not believe. So what might be the reason some would say there is no resurrection? And what rationale does Paul give in response to the assertion? It's almost as if he's talking to other Christians rather than to but if you remember, the, the Pharisees believed in, in resurrection of the dead, but the Sadducees did not. Yeah. And so if you can look at this mixed crowd that would include both Pharisees and Sadducees, um, and, and he's, he's talking to them, and he's directing this question to them. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And even, even now, there are people who will say that. But they, most of them do not believe in God. I mean, this is not a question that 
Um, look, don't you think they had they were willing to address everyone, whether they believed in God or they didn't, or whether they believed in you know atheism or whatever whatever it was. But you find people who, you know, you hear it from time to time. I I don't live in a world. I don't. My world doesn't revolve in the atheistic world, so I don't hear it that often. But I do hear people say, when you die, that's it. There's nothing else. You just go, you get buried and put in the ground so that your body can decompose. Um, there's no belief. Yes, well, me, and I, 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 you know, to be, I live more, uh, to my parents and relatives and whatnot, that, that is more of a common concept. And yet I often feel like they don't really believe that. I mean, if you think about it, if that's all there is, that's a pretty depressing thing because everything you've learned, everything you've done, dies with you. Gone. Hmm? It's gone. There's, there's, there's such a hopeless thought. It and, is. And in reality, that that is essentially, it changes the nature of our thinking here because in this particular case, when we believe in the resurrection of the dead, then we look at this life as a preparation for the next. Yes. But if there is no next, then we're kind of back to that whoever dies with the most toys is king type of thought process. Or, 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 and even then you have to think of the vanity of it all. Because, like you said, as soon as we pass, that there might be some mention of us in, in uh, a book or an obituary or, or what have you, and or there may be some memory of us but eventually it just all decays. And, and everything that we work for, everything that, because if... There is no purpose. There is <laughs> no purpose. There is no purpose to life. If it, I, I haven't had anyone explain to me what purpose there mm -hmm. would be. But then the rationale of Paul here is, is that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. However, the apostles will witness to that resurrection, as well as other disciples. Um, and, and so, as a matter of fact, as well as, as, as Paul, because Jesus came to him under the road to Damascus and said those infamous words, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, who was going out and gathering up Christians to rid them of that, uh, of, of that um, as far as what he saw, it was blasphemous. Suddenly, he became its most art is the faith's most arduous evangelist. So let's look at um, the next paragraph in the Catechism 992, which says God revealed the resurrection of the dead to His people progressively. Hope in the bodily resurrection of the dead established itself as a consequence intrinsic to faith in God as Creator of the whole man, soul, and body. The creator of heaven and earth is also the one who faithfully maintains his covenant with Abraham and his posterity. It was in this double perspective that faith in the resurrection came to be expressed in their trials. The Maccabean martyrs confess, the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. One cannot but choose to die at the hands of men and to cherish the hope that God gives of being raised again by him. Again, we see such an example in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, where it reads, After he had died, they tortured and maltreated the fourth brother, brother in the same way. When he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of mortals with the hope that God will restore me to life. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. So during our last discussion, we talked through scriptural examples from both the Old and New Testaments in relation to our belief in the resurrection of the dead. From that examination, we can see the progression of what is revealed to us in scripture about the resurrection of the dead. But why is this word hope, as it is used in this paragraph of the Catechism, as well as 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verse 14, important to our understanding? What is the significance of hope and why does it, what does it imply in this context? I'm not sure. 
I hope is a strange word when you think about it because it implies for some people and perhaps for me that we're hoping for something but it might not really happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, boy, I hope that I win the lottery. And that's a, the, and, and, and hope is an awful lot like the word pride too in that in itself there are almost two meanings. You know, with pride, you, you, pride is the central, the, the central sin, you know, it's mm-hmm. the father of all sins, and yet we have pride in ourselves, and it's not a bad thing. Hope is the same type of word where it has too many, too, too meanings, I mm-hmm. think. And, I, and of course, I think in the nature of pride, what we really look at is this disordered pride right. as, as the nature of, of sin. Um, but in terms of, of hope, I think one of the things that indicates to us is, is that we are not the final determiner. Now, we can influence, and that may give added reason for our hope, but we're not the final determiner. And this is what we have to keep in, in mind. We like to have a lot of discussions about who, who is going to receive what, as if somehow we are the determiners, but the reality is we're not. We, we can study and we can learn, and more importantly, we can use that for the benefit of how we lead our lives to try to influence that outcome. But the final determination is not that of ours, and that's what I think we, we have to keep in mind when we, when we look, look at those assertions. It keeps us from getting too, too self-confident and too, too uh, so, so assured that we know what we're doing that we quit asking for more help. Yeah. Quit have, quit, we stop wanting to please God. And we stop growing. It starts yeah. becoming all about us. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the thing that we, we have to do anymore. But let's look at two more paragraphs of the Catechism. And this is 996 and 997, which reads, From the beginning, Christian faith in the resurrection has met with incomprehension and opposition. On no point does the Christian faith encounter more opposition than on the resurrection of the body. It is very commonly accepted that the life of the human person continues in a spiritual fashion after death, but how can we believe that this body, so clearly mortal, could rise to everlasting life? What is rising? In death, the separation of the soul from the body, the human body decays, and the soul goes to meet God while awaiting its reunion with its glorified body. God, in his almighty power, will definitively grant incorruptible life to our bodies by reuniting them with our souls through the power of Jesus' resurrection. So here we see reference to the glorified body. What might we expect of the glorified body which will be you reunified with our soul? That is one of those questions that, how should I say it? Two blind people have never seen arguing about the color of blue. I don't think we can ever really figure out what is the input here. It's beyond us. We, we can speculate about what the glorified body might be. Yeah, like is it 33 years? Is it five years? Is mm-hmm. it, what is it? We, we can't know. But we, can, but we can expect from some things we do see in Scripture that it will be a body that's free of affliction. And it will be so, a perfect body. Yeah, and, and so there are parts of us that reflect our personality, <clears throat> in particular uh, our, our face, if you will, um, our, our eyes, our emotions are expressed so much through through our face, uh, our smile, and hopefully not our frowns. But that that all ex- all exists. In other words, our existence, particularly here, is tied to our body, and so our ability to emote. And and those of you on radio can see the way I'm using my hands right now, as as, as I'm kind of just you know. Um, making certain points, that, that is some of the things that we can reflect upon and we can speculate about, but we don't know the fullness of exactly what that might mean. 
But the thing that we, we can see from Scripture is that it will not be a body that is afflicted as we experience it here. And so there may be so much more freedom I think to it. Goes on to people who, who were born with disabilities. Well, not have those disabilities and have that. People who, um, you know, for example, lost an arm or a leg for whatever reason, those will be restored. Um, those who, who maybe couldn't hear will have their hearing restored. So all of the imperfections, whether they're visible or invisible, because there's a lot of us who are walking around with imperfections inside of us that not everybody sees. And those will all be fixed. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. It says, just as we have borne the image of the earthly one, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. And then let's also look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 to 17. It says, then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, who are these wearing white robes and where do they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, these are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night in his temple. The one who sits on the throne will shelter them. They will not hunger or thirst anymore, nor will the sun or any heat strike them. For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So if we look at paragraph 998 of the Catechism, then we come to this question. Who will rise? And the answer is, all the dead will rise. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So we profess the resurrection of the dead, but we often think in terms of resurrection to heaven. What does this paragraph of the Catechism reveal to us? That God is not a warm, soft, fussy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going, to be, he's, he's going to judge us. And like Doug says all the time, he's all, you know, there's a big wall around heaven, and it's, it's going to be tough to get in. And God is going to judge us on what we did with our lives how we took care of those he gave us, he entrusted us with. And um, if we fed our children and we clothed our children, we don't, not just necessarily those who, who are hungry and naked. Well, children would be naked and hungry if we didn't feed them and clothe them, so I guess that fits in there. But if we did not do the things that we are prescribed to do because of the gifts that he has given us, he will judge us on that. And evil cannot enter. And, and also, when we think about, and I don't know this. I mean, I'm not going to presume on judge, well, you know, how all of this is. But he will also judge us, I think, by where we are at. Uh, I have dealt with, uh, I was a foster parent for a while and dealt with children who were uh, quite disturbed. I grew up, loved cared for, um, and life wasn't all that easy, but I, I never, ever in my life did not feel the lack of love. Well, God's going to judge me a little bit different than he's going to judge somebody who, who never felt love, never had love, was abused, and was hurt. The, 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 journey where, the journey that we have been set on He's, I really do believe he will judge us on our journey from where we were and what we took with those gifts. And I think when the, when the catechism brings us down, all the dead will rise. That means the good and the bad. The good all, and the, the bad. all the dead will rise. But the, what is the nature of that rising? And that's reflected in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, others to reproach, and everlasting disgrace. 
And Jesus reinforces this in John chapter 5, verses 24 to 29, where he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Amen, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to his Son the possession of life in himself. And he gave him power to exercise judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good deeds to resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked deeds to the resurrection of condemnation. So we can see that that nature that Yes, all the dead will rise. As a matter of fact, we can pretty much then say, woohoo, yeah, we're all going to rise, but what's the nature of a rising? And the nature of, to where we hope to rise is, is to heaven. Let's move to um, paragraph 999 of the Catechism, and it states, how Christ is raised with his own body. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. But he did not return to an earthly life, So in him, all of them will rise again with their own bodies, which they now bear. But Christ will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body, into a spiritual body. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come? You foolish man, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body which is to be, but a bare kernel. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. The dead will be raised imperishable, for this imperishable nature was put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature was put on immortality. In the next paragraph, it reads, This how exceeds our imagination and understanding. It is accessible only to faith. Yet our participation in the Eucharist already gives us a foretaste of Christ's transfiguration of our bodies, just as bread that comes from the earth after God's blessing has been invoked upon it, is no longer ordinary bread, but Eucharist, formed two things, the one earthly and the other heavenly, so too our bodies, which partake of the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but possess the hope of resurrection. So we often inquire about the how of our earthly existence, that is, the function of science to study and try to understand the how things work in God's creation. Considering how we struggle to understand that which, that which we can physically experience, it should not be a surprise to us that it is a greater challenge to comprehend the kingdom we have not yet experienced. Well, what does these paragraphs of the Catechism reveal to us as to the how we might experience our passing from this world to our existence in the next? Well, we don't know anything else but what we have experienced here on this earth. I, I believe when you watch the face and the actions of a baby who has come from heaven, they still remember heaven. Now, there's nothing to tell me in scripture that this is true. But when you look at babies and they're so happy and they're so content and they often are, are staring up into, into the world above them, I think they're remembering those angels that cared for them in heaven. uh, Then we grow up, and we don't remember that. All we know is what's here. So how do we tell what's going on? How do we we take our classes and say, well, this is what you're going to find in heaven? None of us know. Yeah, Yeah, nobody nobody sends us back a set of blueprints as as far as where everything is or or a map or, uh, or anything along those lines. Um, I'd like to see those blueprints because mm-hmm. Jesus said his home has many rooms. Yeah. And if we look at look to Scripture, uh, particularly Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 36 to 39, it says, while they were speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, 
Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. So he kind of reveals that there is going to be a physical nature of us in that next existence. And so we also have to look at that there is going to be somewhat of a transformation as well. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 38, it says, but someone may say, how were the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come back? You fool, what you sow is not brought to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel of wheat, perhaps or of some other kind. But God gives it a body as he chooses, and to each of the seeds its own body. So if we look at it in that form, if we look at, say, a seed like a wheat seed and how small it is, but yet what it grows to be when it's planted in the field, that does give an indication to us that the body that we experience in this world is not going to be exactly the same as what we, we may have in the next, but it's that glorified body. So let's look at uh, paragraph 1001 of the Catechism. And this asks another question. It says, when? And it answers, definitely at the last day at the end of the world. Indeed, the resurrection of the dead is closely associated with Christ's perusia. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the angels, archangels call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And um, as we look at those, those words at the last day, at the end of the world, it, it indicates a certain, certain time. Now, the old joke, when one begins a trip is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> when is a matter of the relationship of time and events. The catechism tells us the resurrection will definitively happen on the last day and at the end of the world. Are these references the last day and the end of the world one and the same? You know, I never gave that any thought. You're going to explain it, I trust. Well, if we look at it from the standpoint of the last day, the last day of what? And the end of the world, when you put it in other phrases, such as the end of the world as we know it, when, when we look at it in those terms, it's well, not something that is exact science for us. So when we then go back to scripture and we see those types of references as they're communicating to people at that time, we may end up seeing that some of those references of the last day could be references to the last day of, the last day of a time period, the end of the world, as we know it, does it mean it's total destruction, it's total removal, or will it be transformed in some form or fashion? So there are some ambiguities there for us um, as to exactly what those words mean. The one thing that we can look at is, is the fact for us individually, we all will have our last day here. And then we have to look at that start something new. In other words, a new beginning. And that new beginning starts at another beginning then. And we kind of end up kind of linking those together um, as we, we look to that transition. So let's move into uh, paragraph 1002 uh, and paragraph 1007 of the Catechism. And those read, Christ will raise us up on the last day but it is also true that in a certain way we have already risen with Christ. For by virtue of the Holy Spirit, Christian life is already now on earth a participation in the death and resurrection of Christ. And you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And in, in 1007, it says, death is the end of earthly life. Our lives are measured by time, in the course of which we change, grow old, and as with all living beings on earth, death seems like the normal end of life. 
That aspect of death lends urgency to our lives. Remembering our mortality helps us realize that we have only a limited time in which to bring our lives to fulfillment. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So this paragraph of the catechism reminds us that earthly death lends urgency to our lives. So the question becomes, what might this urgency be? It's, it's almost in di- diametrically opposed to the concept of uh, reincarnation, which just goes on and on and on. We do have a short time. And that adds a certain amount of excitement to our lives, certain amount of drive. This is where somebody who has no belief of of God or resurrection, it 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 there's no urgency because you're just going to die and it doesn't really matter after all. Or if you believe in evolution, I mean. Uh, reincarnation, it really doesn't matter what you're doing in your, this life. It's going to make a difference in your next life, maybe, but then you're probably going to mess up there and end up an ant again anyway. You well, know. We used to play Groundhog Day. You know, over oh, over. I <laughs> love Groundhog Day, yes. Uh, this urgency gives more importance to our life here. It, it says, you know, you need to think about these things because it is going to come to an end. What purpose do we put our time? And how much time do we have to prepare? Because as we mentioned in the previous portion of our discussion, we're preparing ourselves for something that is not of our determination. That, and, and so you want to be well prepared, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, and how do I prepare? Well, I have to learn. Uh, I have to learn about my faith. I can I can start out with maybe a little bit of knowledge and think I know everything and find I really don't. And I can think, oh, it's really simple. And yet when I start examining things, it can become extremely complex. And on the one hand, I can say, well, it's been made very easy for me, but there's also someone out there that's meddling in everything that I do. And the race may seem real easy all up until the last mile or maybe even the last yard where somebody trips me and I don't get to finish the race. We have, we have to look at those things. But if I prepare myself well, I increase the chances that I will finish the race. And not only that, that I will finish it in a manner that the person standing there will say, a race well done. Also, of course, you're... You and, and, and I, and I we, we obviously, you know, we like to, to study and to, to read. I mean, this is, I, I wished I had more of a mind to retain it, but that's another story. There are people who do not have the intellect to, to do that, but they prepare it in other ways, too, by, by the goodness of their lives. They might not understand even what, why, why, but they know. And I'm thinking of terms, people like like uh, those with Down syndrome, for for instance, and whatnot. They need to prepare too, but they have a different way. Think of the nature of the crowd. You know, they clap and cheer when the first person comes across the finish line. But I've also seen standing ovations for the last person that came across the finish line, someone who entered the race who ran, and someone that nobody expected could ever finish. Yeah. And when they're able to finally come across, everybody cheers at the inspiration that they just of what, Yeah. So, so preparation can, can't always... The, the learning is so important, but... You know, determination plays a role as well. Yeah. And, and the direction we're going. So I'd like to leave you with Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 36. And it says, But of that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be watchful. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He leaves home and places his servants in charge. 
each with his work, and orders the gatekeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore, you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or in the morning. May he not come suddenly and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. And, of course, you know, I like to, I like to conclude with some quotes from, um, from uh, significant figures within our church and within our faith. And so I'll start with St. Augustine, who said, Perish the thought that the omnipotence of the Creator is unable for the raising of our bodies and for the restoring of them to life, to recall all their parts, which were consumed by beasts or by fire, or which disintegrated into dust or ashes, or were melted away into a fluid, or were evaporated away in vapors. In other words, let us not tell God what you can't say. <laughs> And then St. Polycarp of Smyrna, whoever perverts the sayings of the Lord for his own desires and says that there is neither resurrection nor judgment, such as one is the firstborn of Satan. Let us therefore leave the foolishness and the false teaching of the crowd and turn back to the word which was delivered to us in the beginning. And then Theophilus of Antioch. God will raise up your flesh immortal with your soul. And then, having become immortal, you shall see the immortal. If you will believe in him now, and then you will realize that you have spoken against him unjustly. But you do not believe that the dead will be raised. When it happens, then you will believe, whether you want to or not. But unless you believe now, your faith then will be reckoned as unbelief. So some final thoughts. Today we ask questions about our trust in God's power, our hope, our reasoning, and the nature of the resurrected body. We also discuss questions about who, how, and when, as well as the urgency before us, for no one knows for certain the duration of our life. There are a number of opinions about this belief, and we could discuss a number of stories about things like near-death experiences, but even the raising of Lazarus is not about life beyond this world, but restoring life to this world. The path which Jesus reveals through his resurrection is the path to his kingdom. We are confident in the resurrection. Indeed, the question is not whether we shall rise, but to where. The warnings are many that we must be watchful with our lives, but so too we are told that if we believe in him, we shall be called to his kingdom. That brings us back to previous discussions as to what belief in the Son of God really means. For we are told even the demons believe. And in James chapter 2, verse 19, we see that in the nether world, they are still condemned. There are many things to ponder here, but there is reason for our hope. And if we truly believe in the one who calls us to him, then we must also consider the responsibilities of our belief. We must realize his commandments are not only about us as individuals, but our relationship with God and those with whom he has surrounded us. As we profess and reflect upon our faith, let us consider our responsibilities in his life as they prepare us for the life of the world to come. And speaking of which, that's the subject of our next discussion. Oh my, another hour has passed, as indicated by the clock uh, clanging in the background. So we hope you'll be able to join us next week as we pick up our discussion with the examination of the last line of our profession of faith, which is our belief in the life of the world to come. So let us conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you, and God bless. And again, wanted to remind you that we do have an email that you can contact us if you have any comments or questions. And in particular, if you have any prayers in which you would like to, like us to, to join you with, uh, feel free to send that to us. And we can be reached at armoroffaithradio at gmail.com. 
And I, and I have to emphasize that you include radio after Armor of Faith, because if you just send it to Armor of Faith, it's going to go to somebody else. So be sure, again, to put it on their Armor of Faith radio at gmail.com. Again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, we hope you'll be able to join us next week as we uh, conclude our Profession of Faith series, which uh, has been going on for a number of weeks now, but that also tells you just a little bit about um, all the things that we have to discover, discover, because even as we've gone through the series of discussions, uh, there's so much more that we have the opportunity to learn. But the more we learn, the more difficult we make the job of the evil one to deceive us. Thank you all, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.